First of all, I'd like to welcome everybody back to Agile Talks. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, psychological safety. The title of this webinar is actually uh, the Fearless Team, uh, Candor, Conflict, and Psychological Safety. So with me today, as always, I have our resident panelists and uh, co-founder of Agile Talks, Ron Darnell, Dr. Ron Darnell. So, uh, Ron, say hello. Hello, everyone. How are you? How are you, Chris? I'm doing well. Thank you. It's uh, a, a balmy uh, 76 degrees here in Santa Barbara. I hope you're uh, <laughs> staying in the heat there. Yeah, it's like 95 degrees here in Oklahoma, and it's 8 o'clock at night. So. Oh, my gosh. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, broadcasting from the high atop the beautiful Colston building in downtown Ardmore, Oklahoma, so. Oh, very nice. <laughs> very cool. So, uh, so yeah, so this is a, a subject that we've been talking a lot about. Um, it, it's actually something that's, uh, again, very, very close to me. Uh, it, it's something that I think um, has been getting more attention. Um, I know, Ron, you've been uh, involved or, or reading uh, a lot of literature on this subject um, for a long time now, um, but it's something that Again, going back to kind of the people component of these agile transformations, um, a lot of focus is on process and, and the mechanics. And I think uh, one of the stumbling blocks that I've seen uh, happen uh, or, or biggest challenges I've seen out there is uh, what's holding people back from really reaching more of that true business agility. And it's uh, embedded in you know, the, the, the people, uh, the mindset, uh, like we said, the psychological safety. So, you know, I wanted to hand the mic over to you to start the conversation. And, uh, you know, we have, I think, a, a fair amount of uh, books and articles that we'll be referencing throughout this. As always, if there's any questions from the audience, uh, there's a Q&A panel. Just post your questions there. We'll get to them uh, as soon as possible. And uh, if you're watching this, uh, in a uh, recorded format, then uh, be sure to reach out to us in our Agile Talks LinkedIn group. We'd be happy to continue the discussion there. And uh, with that, Ron, I'll turn it over to you uh, to start getting into the uh, discussion. Well, I want to say I'll, uh, after we finish, I will send you the, the bibliography information for, for these books. So we can put the links to them on I don't know if we have an associate account on Amazon or not, but you could put them on there. People can go out and buy books if they like. Um, Absolutely. But I mean, as you know, Chris, uh, we've worked on these transformations uh, ourselves over the years. And the whole idea of having a safe space for the team members to work in is not, a, not anything new. It comes up every, every transformation. Uh, but just recently, um, Amazon did a big, uh, not Amazon, Google did a big uh, project to find out what it takes for teams, what motivates people, and what what the criteria are, and, and it was called the Aristotle Project, I think is what it was, and what, what they found in this, that psychological safety was by far the number one underpinning uh, factor that tends to motivate uh, teams, and specifically agile teams. And so uh, they did a lot of work based on this book or this research done by Amy Edmondson. Um, back in 1999 or so, she was doing her, her doctoral research and she kind of stumbled across uh, a situation where she was trying to measure errors in a, in a hospital settings, like where people uh, misprescribe prescriptions or, or use the wrong uh, treatments. And what she found was is that the teams that had most psychological safety actually had the most defects. And what it meant was is they just happened to report the most defects. Where the teams that have higher levels of psychological safety reported fewer defects, which meant people were keeping quiet about mm. things. And okay. it's the silence that you can't measure. They didn't feel comfortable bringing up, uh, you know, they were – what she calls didn't want to take a the, the personal uh, interpersonal risk of speaking up because they felt that it'd be held against them or they would have uh, some negative consequence 
And so since that time, she's done a, a, a much deeper dive into this topic. And w what she's found is that um, it's up to the, this fearless team or the fearless or what she calls creating a fearless organization. And we title this creating a fearless team because uh, the teams need to be fearless in, in themselves because, you know, kind of in Agile, our, our unit of measure is the team. We don't really get down to, to individual measurements that much. And so um, the team has to work together uh, to create a, an environment within the team of safety, of psychological safety. But on top of that, the organization, the leadership, the responsibility to create an environment for that. Um, she goes into this, uh, in this book, she goes into a real interesting um, example of Volkswagen. Uh, back in, what was it, early, mid-2000s, mid they uh, came out with this corporate edict that they were going to be the number one uh, car manufacturer in the world and that it was going to be based on their diesel engines. Their, 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 I think it's the turbo diesels that they had. And uh, the, the management created a situation where uh, the engineers that were working on this were afraid to bring up bad news. And... So what they did is they, Jerry, they, they rigged the system so that when these cars were on being tested, their emissions were being tested, they would pass the emissions test. But when they would put in the emission controls, when they were on the road, it would disable the emission control system. So they were spewing out about 40 to 50 times as much pollution into the atmosphere when they were driving than they were when they were being tested. And this was, I'm sure most people know, but this was was discovered. There was, I forget the people, there was a, uh, people who were doing uh, kind of on the road research uh, discovered this problem and they brought it up and it almost put Volkswagen out of business. Um, you know, the, the very, the very thing that they didn't want to happen actually happened. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's at the, at the organizational scale. But w w her point is, is that, uh, you can't measure what people don't say. And if people aren't bringing up ideas, they don't feel that they can take that risk to uh, help organizations innovate, then organizations are not going to innovate and they're going to die off at the vine. And innovation is, you know, a key a key component of, of being agile. Um, so that's, so what do you think about this? You've done some reading on this. If, I mean, uh, what do you what do you what do you think? What's your experience there? Yeah, I mean, one hundred percent. I I couldn't agree more. And I, I think it's um, you know this this dates back a, a a a ways. You know, and and a lot of the material that we've read, you know, collectively just through our our journey so far, um, consistently points to the um, you know the idea and the uh, the the benefit of being what we call this, the psychological safety or, or feeling safe. And I think, you know, if I apply it to teams doing product development, um, for instance, uh, you know, it, it's, it's the, 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 the age old situation where you have, you know, a team that um, sometimes they may feel safe between uh, amongst their peers on the team, their teammates, uh, where they could be candid with each other, uh, they could provide feedback, whether it be good or you know negative or constructive. Um, sometimes they don't even have that level of safety between amongst themselves. But where I really, really start to see it is um, in the management layer, when you have you know the quote unquote boss who uh, a team collectively or individuals may be withholding. Uh, information that their boss may not want to hear um, because it could cause a you know a major risk or a challenge put them off schedule I mean there's hundreds and hundreds of reasons as to why they may hold that back they may so, so they, they hold it to themselves and what happens is that you know that information the greater the longer it's held becomes a greater, greater risk. So you're causing more pain um, 
later on in the project. It's, you know, the more a problem goes, um, you know, un, unnoticed or, or uh, what am I, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the longer a risk stays, the higher, you know, it's, it's the, the cost of change curve, essentially. You know, the longer it stays in a project, the higher cost it gets to fix it, you know, <clears throat> the longer you're in the project. So I always like to hear, you know, I, I'd rather hear, you know, as from a, from a leadership perspective, I'd rather hear quote unquote bad news early than, than good news. So it's, but unfortunately people are fearful for their positions. They don't work in an environment a lot of times that where they feel safe to bring up this, the, the situations or these bad news. And not only that, it doesn't just apply to bad news. It also applies to, like you said, innovation where people individuals amongst a team or a team may collectively have a better way of doing something than their boss is, is asking them or telling them to do. So they don't feel safe to experiment with that. And not only experiment, just to even bring it up to management and leadership because they feel like they're going to be undermining their boss for some reason. So there's a, a, an ego layer there that gets in the way too. And they're fearful for their job, whether it be bad news or trying, you know, not feeling safe to, uh, you know, to bring up a, a better way, a better approach and, and try to, to innovate. So I, I think this is, this permeates almost every organization I've ever been in. And I've seen it for, like you have firsthand, you know, on the front lines, working with these teams, working with leadership and, and managers. Um, it was very interesting to me in my most recent assignment, over at uh, Sony Pictures, when they uh, we performed a uh, a team safety check with our senior leadership team, and the CIO uh, after that that first the two, first two phases, so it, it consisted of getting the group of of senior leaders together and asking them a series of questions about how they felt amongst each other, and then with the CIO and. When the CIO got back and he, he had been in a, a, a conference for a week or so, when he got back, he was so surprised to hear how much information is withheld between, you know, each department head and then from him. When, when people were telling him that this project is moving along nicely or well or according to plan when it really wasn't. Um, so those things are, you know, I, I think hit every layer in the organization, but you know, truly, I couldn't agree more with psychological, if you have a team that feels safe, the individuals feel safe amongst each other in a team environment, but they also feel safe outside of their team, working with other, you know, components, other, other, uh, you know, departments, managers, leadership, that's what really leads to market innovation, because you can, you feel safe to experiment, you feel safe to bring up things and risks early on and things like that and you're not worried for your job so yeah it's just interesting to tie that back to some of these studies uh, the volkswagen example is i think uh really really cool because you know this has been going on for a very very long time and now we're all of a sudden starting to not all of a sudden but we're you know there's a lot of literature and there's a lot of focus on this now and but it's it's not just a you know i think the change has to come from you know the the individuals themselves, and then collectively, you know, the team. Yeah, I don't. I agree with you. Um, you know, it's it's the, the thing about this interpersonal risk that she, she talks about in here is that we all have this little calculation that we do whenever we're uh, in a group setting and we're at in a, in a situation where we're going to speak up. And sometimes it's it's kind of a risk re reward calculation based on the context. And, and sometimes we, we make this almost unconsciously. Um, and it has a lot to do with, you know, going all the way back to how we were brought up. In the Volkswagen example, the guy that's, I can't remember the guy's name, the CEO of Volkswagen at the time. But he was brought up in a very kind of mechanistic kind of, his father was stern and, you know, and then his father's father, this whole long line of, of culture and thinking was all brought in. He didn't even realize what he was doing. And, you know, she talks about setting goal. One of the one of the biggest causes of this is you set basically unrealistic unrealistic goals, and then you refuse to. You don't want to hear this negative information when they're not working out, 
and right. that causes people to modify their their behavior. Um, mm. Now, in agile teams, we work really hard as coaches to try to get people to to speak up. Or we have all kinds of games we play, basically, uh, to you know, in retrospective games, kind of kind of divert the kind of pull the risk out of it and make it safer for people to you know, we have the the blind um, post-it note kind of activities. The the um, forget what they're called now, but the census that you take and try to come to an assessment. We do fist of five and planning poker and all that kind of stuff and to eliminate or mitigate that calculation that we're making. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what she, what she talks about is for the leaders in, in, as coaches, I think this is something we can think about too, is, is setting the stage for a, 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 a fearless team or psychological safety in that's to, to kind of clarify the work, uh, you know, how, how interdependent it's going to be, uh, let people understand that, that, that management or that, that the organization understands that it's a difficult job and um, that you as the manager, coach, product owner, external stakeholder don't know everything, you know, they, and, and ask questions and be, be um, uh, vulnerable, basically, mm-hmm. um, and get – do that and then put put failures in the right way and we we talk a lot in agile about failing fast and you know experiment fail and learn and all this kind of stuff and she amy edmondson dr edmondson kind of talks about intelligent failure and i, I kind of like that uh, term mm-hmm. because that to me it means that we get we fail but we're getting smarter from it and mm-hmm. That's, that's what we want to do. I mean, that's what all those other things are all about, failing fast and, you know, all of that. But I think by, by calling it intelligent failure, um, it kind of puts it in the right context for me. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I, I just want to add to that because that's a, you know, part of um, part of uh, Carol, uh, Dr. Carol Dweck's work that I've been studying um, recently um, you know, refers to the same thing about, you know, you can tie this into a growth mindset and growth mindset obviously ties directly into an agile mindset and what we're talking about. And, um, you know, your, your ability to, you know, for a long time, the growth mindset was thought of as, you know, rather than a fixed mindset, it was thought of as, you know, experiment, fail, like failure is okay. Um, but, it wasn't about just experimenting and failing. It was about getting better. And how you did that was by learning from what you did. Where, where did you get, what was the end result? How could you have done things a little bit differently for, to produce a different outcome? And I think that ties, you know, from, from what I'm hearing you say, I think that ties nicely into this intelligent, uh, Failing. Yeah, intelligent failure, and I I like that term. I'm not real crazy about the term psychological safety. I understand what it means. I just mm-hmm. think I think when you talk about that with with software developers or team members, it's too it's a little it's a little academic. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, I'd like to I'd like us to maybe come up with some kind of a, a, you know agile is all about you know kind of new age terminology, you know, Japanese Zen stuff, you know, it'd be mm-hmm. nice to find something that's kind of like that and that people can understand what it means. I'm sure there's a, there's a, there's gotta be a Buddhist or, or a Zen uh, or Japanese word that means the same thing, you know, kind of mm-hmm. like ties in. She talks about that in this book. Um, but I, I thought this was interesting when I was, when I've been, this has been come up to me a lot lately because of the organization where I'm at. We're, we're doing some of the team safety analysis that you talked about. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things that's nice about this book is she's got her survey questions here in the back. And so you could probably take what's here and, and build a, a, an assessment for a, for a team or an organization just from that book. But what's interesting to me uh, is that back in the, 
in the 70s when I was at Texas Tech, uh, we had, they had the lecture, a lecture series where, you know, they would bring in guest speakers and you got credit for showing up. And pretty much that's all we did was just show up. I don't know if we, we didn't pay a lot. <laughs> but one of them, one of them did get my attention. And that's this book here, the guy that, Dr. Jerry Harvey, Jerry B. Harvey, that he came up with something he calls the Abilene Paradox. And it's, it's, it's really what Volkswagen was into. And what, she, what he talks about in here, I'm just going to kind of look in the book because it's been, but he says here, stated simply, when organizations blunder into Abilene Paradox, they take actions contrary to what they really want to do and defeat the very purposes they're tra trying to achieve. And mm -hmm. the reason he says that is nobody, nobody feels like they can step up and take, take the personal risk. In this case, it, specifically in what he's talking about, is being ostracized from the group. Mm -hmm. One of the, one of the things, an ostracized can be being fired, being shunned, which is, you know, if you bring up an idea that the group thinks is really good and they fired you for it, you can be, sh be you know, that kind of public shaming, which happens sometimes even when there's no authority figure around. Mm -hmm. um, but so it's this fear that we have of being ostracized from the group that we feel like that we're, we're connected to, mm -hmm. which, which is it's a little different than she's, what she's talking about. But it's still kind of the same interpersonal calculation that we make. You know, do I really want to put myself out there? in this situation to these people mm -hmm. and you know whatever that calculation is and so one of, she brings up some ways to, to to talk about how to do this and she mentions this book Ray Dialo's book uh, principles uh, Ray Dialo is the or was or I guess he still is I'm, I'm not sure what his role is he's been trying to retire for a number of years but it, he's the uh, founder in major principle behind Bridgewater Associates, which is the, I think they're still the world's largest hedge fund um, in, in the country. And he, what he did is he took, he took all of his business principles and put them in, a, in its book. And his main principle is that as an employee of or associate of Bridgewater, uh, you don't have the right to hold back information. You know, I like the way he puts that. You, you don't have the right to hold back information. But at the same time, people in organization have the duty to respect your respect that, you know. And so he, he, he calls it the rad, uh, pursuit of uh, transparency or pursuit of truth through radical transparency. Mm -hmm. and so he, people keep, he, he likes to, he, he destigmatizes uh, failure and that everybody's encouraged to fail, the faster they fail, uh, and the, you know, they're learning from it, and he rewards people for failing, and you know, probably more so than succeeding. Um, and it's, so he, he, he kind of has that concept, and she doesn't really take it so far as a right, but I like that uh, if you're gonna belong to the group and be a participant in the group, then you have a duty or you don't have a right to, uh, to withhold information that may be valuable to that group. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of like putting it that way. I wouldn't mind seeing it listed in, in like a, uh, when we do working agreements, you know, that it, it, you know, they always talk about, uh, you know, you want to speak up or have respect, leave titles at the door and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, great to just say, hey, uh, no one has the right to withhold valuable information. Uh, yeah, whether that's, I, I, I totally agree. And again, whether that's, you know, a, a, a risk you may be introducing, whether it's, um, uh, you know, something that you don't feel comfortable taking on, um, that, you know, based on skill set, experience, whatever it is, or it's an idea that you feel may be a better approach and lead to a better outcome. Um, you know, whether that's something that, that you know, was put in motion by, you know, your boss or uh, management or, or leadership. And one thing I want to touch on, Ron, because as, as you're talking through some of this, um, I think, and we talk about a lot about this, and it's, I, I think one of the underlying, you know, um, 
what's it, not, not a principle, but I guess you could call it a principle. But one of, one of the underlying things about safety and feeling safe is trust, right? So, you know, we talk so much about trust and it's just like glossed over. It, it's, yeah, you know, we need to trust our team. Yeah, sure. We're, we're going to trust our team. We need to trust each other. But if you don't have that level of trust, it's hard to feel safe. You know, if you can't trust that your leadership team, your manager, your, your boss, whatever you want to call it, depending on your, your setting or environment, um, that you're going to bring up, you know, either good news or bad news, great, a, a new idea, whether, it, you know, it's not something that the team agrees or, or, you know, leadership agrees you're going to pursue or not. But if you don't have that level of trust that you can, you know, share that information, then you have no safety to begin with. So I think trust is a big component to safety. Would you agree or, or disagree with that? Uh, well, I agree that it's a big component of, of a team uh, safety amongst a, in an organization and team. But the thing about trust, it's, it's built through experience. You know, trust is not something that most, most of us are willing to just unconditionally uh, give, which this kind of gets me back to uh, Dr. Harvey, this thing. Um, when he was speaking at the conference, he said that uh, the, the, the cure to this is this unconditional acceptance of your team members. And that's the trust component. Mm -hmm. So you need, you need to go in this, uh, in, in with your team and, and trust them. And, and when I say unconditional, I don't mean they can get away with it. But just accept people for who they are and where they're at in, in, their, in their life. So... They yeah. could be somebody that's a key contributor, talented to down somebody that's junior that's just learning this stuff. But the idea is to realize that uh, people are going to make mistakes and they're human, and don't don't judge them at that level. Uh, judge yeah. them as, as as humans and build that trust over time. Yeah. Um, so you're right, it, but it is trust is something that you just can't put ten people together and they're all going to trust each other. No, absolutely not. You have to earn trust, you know. This is where, you know, we were talking, uh, listen, you had, uh, well, we had Heidi on here for the podcast, and she was talking about issues that she she sees with the Tuckman model of team, the phases, the, you know, the storming, norming, forming thing of it. Mm -hmm. and thinking about that in the context of building, creating a team that is, uh, has psychological safety, this fearless team. And maybe this this storming phase is is really the phase where they build the trust and the psychological safety to move on to the next phase. You know, right. most of the models don't really, you know, most of the literature that I've read on this the Tuckman model doesn't really go into a lot of detail about what happens there. They just say, hey, they're all trying to. There's conflict. They try to you know, get to know each other, and you know, a, after time they work it out. But right. I think maybe that if we dive a little deeper into teams that that storming phase that he talks about. Maybe that's where the trust and the psychological safety gets built in a team that makes it to the performing stage is one that is able to create that context where those teams that don't get there and eventually fail, uh, you know, don't meet their objectives or goals. Uh, maybe they don't get to that point of psychological. Yeah. It may be a context to look at it, look at it in that way. Um, yeah, yeah, and that I think that brings up a whole other debate on you know the the dynamic reteaming model with people you know coming in and out because I, I I think that you know there there is new new people entering the team, people leaving the team. There's uh, you know there's a there's a um, replenishment of trust that needs to be built um, in in those cases. And yes. It takes a while to get there, and um, you know. So I, I so that, that's a whole other topic. But, you know, it's just yeah. something. Yeah, it's, it is a whole other topic. But I got to thinking about uh, this context of psychological safety as it relates to how teams uh, build trust. You know? Yeah, yeah, uh, certainly. Yeah. But the the big the biggest thing she talks about is that it's not easy, uh, and it's not. It doesn't mean being nice. Um, you know, you have to set goals that are challenging and, and 
uh, for the for the team objective. So if you're say you're a product owner, um, you know you need to set, uh, I guess, w work for the team that's challenging and that that is, um, you know, demanding. There has to be some, in my my view, if there's no pain involved with failing, then there's no motivation to learn from it. There's no intelligence in that. And yeah. so that's why I, I like to coach teams to be aggressive in setting your goals. It's like, you, you know, if you're, look, if you're doing scrum and you're putting together a sprint backlog, you know, push, challenge yourself, you know, and make it consequential if you don't, if you don't achieve, but it's okay not to achieve that, right? Yeah. It's, you want to make it consequential so that it's, you, you have to take a serious look at what happened and why it, we didn't make our commitment but at the same time, it needs to be something that everybody recognizes is not a not a reflection of of uh, poor performance. It's more a reflection of uh, what do we need to learn. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. I have a you know I wanted to cite a few things. I, I've been reading this article. Actually, I read this article uh, recently. I think I, I sent the link over to you as well and, and you perused it. But the uh, an article in the Harvard Business Review, and it was by uh, a gal by the name of Laura on uh, Del Lizona, and called High Performing Teams Need Psychological Safety, Here's How to Create It. So if anybody's interested in, in that, uh, I'll post a link uh, in the show notes as well. But she had, uh, you know, after uh, interviewing a few folks, uh, probably the most notable one was uh, by, uh, she talked to, to uh, Paul Sanagata, who's head of industry at Google again. And I think that was part of that study. Uh, and he said, there's no team without trust. And they, and they, he, they, they tie in trust and, uh, you know, um, into uh, safety, you know, team safety, et cetera. Uh, and he, he makes a couple cool, you know, she makes a couple cool quotes here about when the workplace feels challenging, but not threatening, teams can sustain the broaden and build mode. Oxytoxin levels in our brains rise, eliciting trust and trust-making behavior. This is a huge factor in team success. Um, so you can increase, how do you, and then she goes on to have four points. And I just wanted to mention these quickly. We don't have to talk about them in detail, but I wanted to, you know, uh, you know, just put a few things out there and, and you probably have a few that you can add to what people could do um, to help, you know, their teams out there. Um, whether you're a member on a team or, you know, leading a team or, or coaching a team, but how can you increase psychological safety in your own team? So I guess the first one is approach conflict as a collaborator and not an adversary. Um, so I thought that one was a, a, a good one. And uh, the second one was speak human to human. You mentioned that earlier, Ron. Um, you know, treat everybody as, as humans. And underlying, uh, just to go on and speak human to human, the second point, underlying every team's who did what confrontation or universal needs, such as respect, competence, social status, and autonomy. And recognizing these deeper needs naturally elicits trust and promotes positive language and behaviors. So um, the third one was anticipate reactions and plan counter moves. She goes on to say, thinking through in advance how your audience will react to your messaging helps ensure your content will be heard versus your audience hearing an attack on their identity or ego. The fourth one was replace blame with curiosity. I particularly like this one. So if team members sense that you're trying to blame them for something, you become their saber tooth tiger. And what they're saying instead is the alternative to blame is curiosity. If you believe you already know what the other person is thinking, then you're not ready to have a conversation. Instead, adopt the learning mindset, knowing you don't have all the facts. So I thought that was a really good one. And then of course, ask for feedback on delivery. Um, how would you deliver your message to SARMs or opponent? Ask for feedback about that. What worked and what didn't work in my delivery, et cetera. And then the sixth one to your engine was measure psychological safety. It doesn't have to be some kind of formal survey that's sent out organizational wide and I, I, I've worked on such surveys before, but, you know, just quick conversations with team members, you know, how safe do you feel, you know, when you're, you know, relaying bad news or, or working amongst your peers or with your boss, things like that. 
real easy, just conversational things you can do to help start to build that psychological safety within the team setting. Yeah, it's an interesting article. Um, I, I like the uh, replace blame with curiosity that, that gets down to, you know, let's solve, let's look at this failure or this problem we have as a, as a, uh, as a, as a positive thing instead of a negative thing. Um, the shaming is, is a big, sometimes a big problem in teams, especially where, you know, you have, have specialists and, and, or people that have a certain kind of experience. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that, so sh replace shame with curiosity as well. Uh, I like that. Um, this, this article talks about anticipate reactions and plan counter me measures. You know, one thing we can do is, as coach our agile leaders and, and uh, stakeholders to do is try to un understand the context of who they're talking to the team you know uh, don't make things don't bring things down like orders I, I worked at one transformation and they had uh, everybody report on their velocity they were using the story points and if your velocity was 15 percent variance from what you had your team had committed to they wanted the scrum master to to write some kind of um, reasoning you know explanation and the way that was perceived by the teams and by is that people were looking over their shoulder and it was a negative thing if you didn't meet these results and so what happened was is every everything everybody just met their commitments and there was no push to do it but the thing is, it really, I think what management wanted to do is they wanted to see, they had 20, 30 some odd teams, and I, 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 this is what they told me that they wanted to find out, to understand, is that if there were any kind of common uh, roadblocks or, or, you know, any kind of thing where they could help re remove impediments to these teams. Well, right. the te teams took it as, well, I'm being measured and I'm, I'm going to see, receive negative consequences of that. So that's where understand who you're talking to. You know, right. uh, I think it could have reframed that in such a way that um, maybe it would have got their, got the intent that they wanted to, but it was just a morale killer. Uh, yeah. You know, it was just, just purely based on the delivery. Yeah. Yeah. Which, and, yeah. I mean, I think I understand their intent. Uh, but the, the context, the, the way they, the way they communicated it, uh, and, how, and to who they communicated to, they didn't really take into consideration how this might affect right. uh, for those people. That's you know the old um, saying that be careful what you measure because you're going to get what you measure. <laughs> right. This, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Prime example. Yeah. Um, one of the things though that's interesting about all of these things that even all of these books really talk about it is something about called productive conflict um, in in Ray Dilo's book and in, in even the Dweck book that you're talking about on mindset uh, fearless organization book uh, one of the key things the key properties I guess of a fearless organization is that they it's not like there's if you have a team that's really there's no conflict then you probably have a team where there's no psychological safety or very little psychological safety because these teams really need to get in there and duke it out with each other. And people should hold their their views if they think their view is valuable to the outcome of the team and organization. Uh, they need to fight for those. And one hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. You need to have productive conflict. I was actually had I had the uh, opportunity to spend about. I guess it was six months or so out in out at Bridgewater Associates, Ray Dilo's uh, Dilo's book. I was out there with Valtech uh, Consulting Company when I was with him. I think it's like 2005 or something like that. And I got to see how this works in action. And there was serious conflict over there. So, uh, you know, he created what he calls a meritocracy, and the conflict is how they they come. The idea is is that through that conflict the best ideas are going to surface to the top. Mm -hmm. And that's that productive conflict that underlines all this stuff. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Harvey in the Abilene Paradox book 
he talks about what he calls phony conflict. And that's what happens when the failure occurs and everybody sits around and blames each other for the problem. And, mm -hmm. But they don't really address the problem because the problem is the fact that people weren't willing to tell the truth and speak up. And, but they're blaming each other for it instead of really getting down and saying, well, I, you know, I, we didn't speak up. And right. he, he talks about that. Um, and it happens in all of these. Uh, the very thing that you don't want to happen happens, right, when there's no psychological safety. Like in the case of Volkswagen, obviously they didn't want to have uh, their, their market share. I think they lost about 60% of their market share, mm -hmm. you know. They didn't, and the guy that's the CEO, he didn't want to lose his job, I'm sure. He did. He was eventually fired. They didn't want to pay all those fines. But by not having a, a fearless environment where their, the people in the organization could bring bad news and highlight failure, or, or what I say, in, in this case, it just wasn't feasible to do what they wanted to do, um, the very thing they were trying to avoid happens in the first place. Uh, right. You know, so it's the opposite of what happens if you don't have that, that safety. So I think it's very important. Uh, now, even um, Edmondson, she talks about how, yeah, you can probably have an organization where there's no psychological safety, but it's got to be, uh, the work has to be basically mindless work. You know, and we're, we're building robots now to do that kind of work. So in knowledge work, uh, if you don't have psychological safety, uh, you're pretty much going to produce an inferior product. You're either, one, not going to bring the product to market, or two, get it to market and someone else is going to surpass you because yeah. they have better ideas. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, great topic. And, uh, you know, as we told everybody, I think we should maybe wrap up unless you got any further thoughts, Ron, anything you want to close with? or No, I think it's a – I think this is a uh, – the study, the Aristotle project there at uh, Google, I think it was Google, I think it was Google, um, really kind of was the, this is something that we've been, we've all kind of known. I mean, even going back to 1974, uh, it's been studied. And we've kind of, as coaches and people that work in organizations know that we talk about it all the time. And we know that trust has to be there and we have to be willing to speak up and, you know, we want conflict. But I think the, the Aristotle study and the project really brought this up is that psychological safety is the underlying factor that enables everything else for a fearless team. Yeah. And I, I think uh, one of the things we coach is, is we can, we tend to coach, we've had a couple of webinars about this, about just coaching process. Uh, I, I think maybe we, we should, we should uh, coach, psychological safety in in process will take care of itself i think 100 percent, yeah and, and 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 i think part of how we open this and, and i'm always talking about this there's you know the the people and the mechanics and i think if you there's always so much focus on process optimization and there's which is more on the mechanical side and process coaching but there's not as much focus um I'm starting to see it more, which is great, but not as much focus on people coaching. And, you know, you can only optimize process to a certain point if, you know, the systems and, 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 and people around it and supporting it, um, you know, don't reach these levels of psychological safety and trust. You are going to hit a wall and you're not going to bring out the best in teams and you're not going to create the highest performing teams that you that you could if you had these components and had these elements in place and people felt that the level of trust and psychological safety you're not going to innovate as much and so the two really have to work hand in hand but to your point if you were to put those things in place and you were to coach to the people and coach to psychological safety and make that a priority you know systems and everything else that we're trying to do and the value that we're trying to produce on a more rapid, more frequent basis and, and higher quality, that I think will naturally happen as a result of that. Yeah, yeah. I agree 100%. I, 
you know? Yeah. I want these teams to kind of own the process and they need that ability to innovate, like you said, and that comes from trust and, and being able to explore uh, ideas and analyze uh, problems. And productive conflict and all the other things that we've touched on today. Yeah, 100%. I, I think it's our duty as as co- as as you know folks in these positions that can influence one or you know in some instances many many teams and even managers and, and leaders that you know it's our it's our duty out there as as we continue our journey to to coach to those things and, and make them a priority and uh, not just you know how can we have a more efficient stand up you know not less about process coaching and more about you know, all these other things that, you know, collectively come together um, to get us to a more, you know, agile team and agile organization and, and a more innovative and, and organization. So um, anything to add, Ron, or else uh, I think we can close out? No, I'm good. It was a great talk. I mean, I think we could go on for a long time. Um, oh, yeah, all night. You know, uh, <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to ask that anybody that, may see this uh, if you're interested uh, send us an email and, and talk about it. if you want to come on maybe we can set that up and explore this further uh, yeah that's that's what agile talks is all about absolutely yeah we welcome anybody who wants to come on the show and um the webinar the podcast anything and if you haven't joined the uh us on linkedin we've got a, the agile talks linkedin group so you can join us there you can also visit agile talks uh website at agiletalks.co.co and uh we will post uh all these links to these great these great books and, and articles uh in the show notes um you can watch this uh well you may be watching on youtube or within the uh the agile talks group but uh thanks for joining ron Always a pleasure. Always great discussion. You're and, welcome. Uh, stay cool. Yeah, and there. maybe we'll, uh, we'll think of it. If we'll have a topic for next week. If anybody out there has a suggestion, send it on. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Awesome. Okay. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Rod. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.